First of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to the organisers of today's event. It's lovely to be here and it's nice to be amongst people with common interests. And, um, yeah, so today I thought I'd discuss some of my PhD findings, which was at the University of Glasgow uh, under the supervision of Professor David Smith in Central East European Studies. And um, now, okay, Eurovision is an event which people have opinions on. They uh, love to hate it, they laugh at it. But um, it's quite interesting looking at it and from, you know, beneath the glitz and the, the tackiness of it. And 10 years or 11 years ago now, when Estonia won the contest, it came at a time when EU accession talks were ongoing. And with this, they launched the Welcome to Estonia campaign as well. So the, immediately, the image of Estonia was linked to hosting Eurovision. So with that con within that context, I'd li like to discuss how these elite-level discussions were received by the population as a whole in the context of an allegedly plural society state, home to ethnically diverse populations. So nation building in Estonia and other and the Baltic states essentially represented the competition for power in which the various national elites sought to naturalise their own particular model of state institutions and gain legitimacy for these claims to power. They did this by invoking a particular vision of what constitutes the national political community and by propagating this amongst the population through speeches, interviews and the wider media. The aim was to create and impose from above a so-called imagined community, to use Benedict Anderson's term. Now, the dimensions of state and nation building also involve who, be who belongs in legal terms, essentially on the citizenship level. There is also the various cultural dimensions of nation building projects, which draw upon various raw materials, such as language, ethnicity, and religion. And in Estonia, language, of course, and other Baltic states, played a symbolic role in nation building, and the implementation of one official state language, Estonian, can be, considered, can be seen as a clear direction of the state building process in Estonia. Estonia can, of course, be considered to be a plural society state. However, it's one which remains enmeshed with an avowed and post-colonial network of identity political discourses, encompassing the Estonian, encompassing the Estonian state, its Russian-speaking population, the Russian Federation, and the governments of the EU and other Euro-Atlantic organisations. There's also, of course, the external or international dimension to state and nation building projects. Part of the process of discursively constructing the nation is to establish its coordinates in time and space and relate it in situation to other en entities, for example, Russia, the EU, CIS, USA, as well as larger geopolitical categories, essentially putting the country on the map and proving itself to be a reliable partner. Estonia, in its quest for EU membership, sets about on a course to prove its so-called European credentials. This is evidence of various speeches by political elites throughout the 1990s. Estonian political elites cultivated an image of the country as a small Baltic state, the little country that could, to quote Mark Long. In this context, events such as Eurovision and nation branding initiatives can have significance attached to them, since they were used by newly sovereign nations as they sought to seek their position on the world stage. Effectively, nation branding initiatives and events like Eurovision can be seen as a form of soft power, in that they're not characterised by military prowess and are better suited to public diplomacy. Arguably, though, there is a tension between nation branding and nation building. To what extent is branding a tool or is it a practice? And what images do nation branders seek to promote, and who is this image for? Applied to a case study such as Estonia, enmeshed with a discourse of post-colonialism, this raises further questions as nation branding effectively transforms a civic image, such as a flag, into something which is revered by many, into something which is contested and calculated. Nation branding can be defined as the phenomenon by which governments engage in self-conscious activities aimed at producing a certain image of the nation-state. As I say, this raises the pertinent question of which version of national identity is promoted. And in the Estonian case, it's arguably the ethnic Estonian paradigm of nationhood. But then how does this fit in with the discourses of multiculturalism which emanated from Estonian political elites in the run-up to EU accession? An analysis of Eurovision therefore provides the ideal medium for investigating these processes. Celebrating its 50th year in 2005, Eurovision is a symbolic contact zone between European cultures and an arena for European identification. It's a site where the cultural struggles over the meanings, frontiers and limits of Europe, as well as the similarities and differences existing in Europe, are enacted. Since the 1990s, Eurovision has been changing rapidly in response to the continent's shifting political, economic and social realities. 
The number of competing countries has nearly doubled, and new entrant countries have come to dominate the contest. The Western European media and contest insiders have portrayed these developments as wrongful domination. These anxieties were echoed and fueled by large attentions within Europe about westward migration and perceived different levels of economic and cultural development between East and West. Eurovision has therefore become a stage on which the changing realities of Europe are being played out. The day after Estonia won Eurovision in May 2001, the victory was seized upon by Prime Minister Mark Lahr when he addressed the jubilant crowd in Tallinn. So that quote there shows how the, the image was linked immediately to Estonia. And of course, that's whimsical and you know, it's semi ridiculous looking back now. But I think that provides an insight into actually the wider debates going on at the time. The international image of Estonia was very much on the agenda at this time. And the media coverage of this victory was extensive and euphoric. It was also seen by political elites and certainly people in Estonian television as more than just a song contest. It represented Estonia being accepted by Europe and it remains to this day the largest international competition that Estonia has staged. The rhetoric surrounding Dave Benton, one half of the winning duo, provides a fertile ground for exploration of multiculturalism in Estonia. Benton was held up as a symbol of multicultural, Estonian multiculturalism in action at a time when the European Union and Council of Europe were closely scrutinising Estonian policy towards the Russian-speaking minority. Benton is a Dutch national. He moved, to Aruba in, he moved from Aruba in 1997, and he's a point of interest not because of his story as an immigrant to Estonia, but also because he is to date the only black person to have ever won the Eurovision Song Contest. Benton and his partner, Tanel Pada, were supported by the group 2XL, which included two Russian speakers. So therefore, the Estonian entry in 2001 can be seen as construction of multiculturalism to a European audience, the song itself being called Everybody. It's quite interesting, though, comparing the media coverage and the, the discourses from the political elites, which I, which I undertook as part of my, my PhD. The coverage suggests that they've... Benton's ethnic origins were not as invisible as the politicians I interviewed tried to portray. In the context of EU accession, Benton could be seen as a usable figure for Estonia's political elites, as I say. Many politicians commented that Benton representing the country was entirely appropriate for a modern multicultural democracy such as Estonia, since he was the embodiment of the integration model. Benton represents the desires of the political elite keen to portray Estonia as a liberal multicultural country in the run-up to the EU accession. However, several of the ground roots responses told a different story, and my respondents alluded to underlying attitudes which were not engaged with in the media or by politicians at the time. Now, that was the, I was never, it was never my intention to discuss racism and not in any way suggesting that Estonia is, you know, racism exists in every society and I'm not suggesting that it's more prevalent in Estonia than anywhere else. But what is interesting is, as I say, this clear division between the so-called elite level and the grassroots level respondents in my studies. A closer reading of Benton's interviews shows that he himself went to great lengths to integrate into Estonian society, and he buys into the ethnic Estonian narrative of the nation, that to be accepted in society you need to speak Estonian, and also that many Russians who do not speak Estonian are, willing, are unwilling to try. Benton's story suggests that issues concerning linguistic, ethnic, ethnic and linguistic and minority integration in Estonia are far more complicated than the previous literature suggests. And I believe that this in turn makes the story all the more fascinating, but all the more contradictory. As highlighted earlier, politicians such as Mark Lahr and Signe Kivi immediately made a link between the international of Estonia and hosting Eurovision. It was seen by a way of launching Estonia on the international stage as the EU accession talks included. Mm -hmm. It was a mammoth undertaking though, and in those days, it was only as a budget of five million pounds, that's how much it cost to stage it in 2002. When the entire annual budget was Estonian television, eight million pounds was taken into consideration, the enormity of the undertaking becomes clear. Estonian officials had to confirm only a month later that they would stage the event the following year. So I'm just catching up my slides here. These are some of the so Estonia was, quote, too poor to host Eurovision. That was what was reported in June 2001 in the UK. Ultimately, failure to host this event would have confirmed the assertion that Estonia was ill-equipped to compete on the same level as other EU members and would have cult arguably cultivated an image of Estonia as a poor former Soviet Republic rather than a prospective EU member. 
Ultimately, Eurovision was used to launch Estonia as a modern Nordic state. And the rhetoric concerning the financing of the event reveals that the government saw value in hosting this competition, namely also to dispel negative stereotypes of a backward Estonia. And that's precisely what politicians have been trying to do ever since independence. Even a cursory glance of the content of the 2002 show reveals much about the Estonian narrative of nationhood. The theme chosen by Estonian television was one of the modern fairy tale. And in the official booklet for the 2002 contest, the link between Estonian history and this concept was reinforced. The fairy tale analogy links in with the more traditional discourse of nationalists who portray nations as primordial, <coughs> where historical actors have awoken from a period of repression, in this case, Soviet rule. The opening scenes of Eurovision 2002 also portrayed Estonia as a modern country with an ancient past. Again, these images, I think, uh, portray Estonia as somehow ahead of the game. It's interesting that earlier on we, we mentioned that Estonia was the first country to be invited to EU accession talks in 97. They were the first country to win Eurovision. They were the first country to launch a nation branding campaign in the area. So as each national song was introduced, small video clips and postcards depicting these well-known fairy, fairy tales were screened. And as I say, whoops, the clips <coughs> did try to portray Estonia in a certain way, so countless internet connections ahead of the game. But what's also interesting, note that, that sauna, Extreme Heat from Estonia, was screened directly before the finish entry. <laughs> aligning Estonia with Nordic, Nordic sphere again. What the, what's also clear is that there were subtexts between the Estonian and Russian entries. The Estonian entry had Sleeping Beauty, again an analogy for how Estonians perhaps see their country, and the Russian entry had the slogan Freedom screen directly before them. And it's quite interesting, I, I did ask Johan Pardon, who is the executive producer of the event, and this is what he said. That it was a deliberate, uh, uh, like jovial reference to the past, but it was one which uh, perhaps would have been lost in some of the Russian speakers. Moreover, there was absolutely no reference to any of the clips to Estonian multiculturalism, which, when contrasted with the discussions surrounding Dave Benton in the media, it appears to be a point in hand. Perhaps multiculturalism would have meant addressing the Russian speaker minority. And it's quite interesting that the postcard images there was Viliandi, there was Tartu all over, and yet Narva was conspicuously absent from the <laughs> An examination of debates surrounding Eurovision therefore serves as a mirror image of wider identity debates ensuing in Estonia. Those who do not speak Estonian were a source of great anxiety for many of my ethnic, respondents, ethnic Estonian respondents, and yet those who do speak Estonian were somehow singled out. The situation is therefore multifaceted. It's not just a sole language issue. And as the bronze riots show, as, sorry, as the bronze soldier riots have shown, integration issues are more complicated than previously suggested. Ten years on, Estonians appear to be far more cynical towards Eurovision as an international event. And perhaps this can be seen as a manifestation of confidence and a departure from the previous intense interest in Estonia's standing in the world. EU and NATO accession in 2004 arguably marked the culmination of this return to Europe and Estonia. However, authors such as Merli Acuse argue that Orientalist narratives depicting new member countries from Central Eastern European Europe as not quite fully European have persisted beyond 2004. And again, this has been seen in Eurovision itself with the othering of states who have recently joined Eurovision. And many Estonians themselves buy into this. So therefore, Eurovision offers an opportunity for the othering of the East. It effectively shows how Estonians perceive themselves generally. The respondents interviewed for my research displayed an aversion to being discursively lumped together with other Eastern countries. Despite this, the continued participation of Estonia suggests that Eurovision remains an important event in terms of ritual. And it was paid, Estonian participation in 2010 to 2011 <coughs> was paid for by Enterprise Estonia. He saw it as a viable way of promoting Estonia to the international community. This is at a time when Estonian television had faced many cutbacks. So in a sense, it highlights that Eurovision has a symbolic role in terms of maintaining an international image, or to quote President Ilvis, it has become another boring Nordic country. 
<laughs> My research is effectively a historical study and it highlights the nature of socio political identity debates at a specific time and place. Currently, Azerbaijan are preparing to host the event this year, and with this come serious political questions concerning human rights and freedom of the press in the country, as well as ongoing territorial disputes with neighbouring Armenia. The event therefore takes on significance for the authorities in Azerbaijan, who are likely to face increased scrutiny from the international community. As the contest continues to expand and be staged in new territories, it offers potential for further research in the future. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Mindaugas Kvitkaskas, Director of the Lithuanian Literature and Folklore Institute in Vilnius. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to be here again. Just a few months ago, I was present here at the Polish conference uh, at a discussion on Czesław Milos. And uh, well, that was one more example of that the fruitful debate among the Lithuanians and the Poles uh, continued despite the conflicts of the political elite. Uh, well, today I'm uh, going to uh, discuss uh, the changing uh, changes uh, in the relations between the writers and their audience in the literature and in society in the Lithuania during the years of the independence. Uh, well, uh, these, uh, these transformations are really uh, important and in some sense symptomatic uh, because many writers had a key role during the process of liberation during the fight for independence. And later on, they tried to uh, uh, find a new position in a changing society. And uh, their attitudes, their changing responses to the social transformations of Lithuania may also reveal some uh, uh, well, symptomatic uh, situations in our culture. Well, it's often claimed that uh, modern social and cultural processes which were shaped over hundreds of years in the West, uh, occur suddenly in the Eastern Europe at an accelerated tempo and it leaps forward and break roots. Uh, this has been determined by continuous cultural and life tensions in those nations. Nevertheless, as uh, German writer Günther Grass has once said, uh, it is better to live in the West, but it is more fun in the East. Well, uh, in Lithuania in the early 1990s, uh, just as it has happened several times throughout history, everything changed at once. Uh, political and social relations, the economy uh, and the horizons of rather and culture. Uh, this time the historical change and civic freedom coincided with a sh shift toward globalizing postmodern culture. And uh, this uh, situation is really paradoxical. It's a double post, post-Soviet and postmodern at once. And the question is, for the writers, for literature, was how should literature overcome the sudden rupture between the customary forms of language and the society that find itself in this double post situation. Uh, during the Soviet era, within the societies of the Baltic countries, the fight for autonomy and democracy was, in many cases, inspired by the hope that it would be possible to re-establish a glorious and European national state, which was uh, had been destroyed by the occupations. Back in the, uh, in the 19, uh, early 1990s, in, people, in people's minds and in texts written by intellectuals, there was a very strong romanticized myth of a return to the past and a rebirth of culture. Uh, it was the idea of a renaissance of Lithuania in Europe, in the world, a cultural renaissance. And uh, through this idea, the realities of the uh, liberal capitalism, uh, consumerism, informational, the information technology, and uh, the paradoxes of postmodern relativism were really not apparent. Uh, the complications of identity, the ingrained, ingrained Soviet habits and uh, mimicries, the stereotypes of modern nationalism, of patriarchal gender relations, traumas of memory, these were not objectively apparent and perhaps uh, well, could not be appeared at, uh, at that time. Therefore, uh, the reality of post-Soviet independence could not mean anything other than the breakdown of many cherished cultural myths. Aside from all these complications, literature suddenly found itself in a post-literate situation, 
the post literacy which I'm used in uh, uh, contemporary uh, studies of uh, literacy and reading. Uh, the former place of literature was encroached upon by electronic media and mass consumerism and the huge flows of information these have generated. And they have affected traditional reading habits. That's why the writers that had such a powerful cultural authority in the early 1990s, uh, late 80s, uh, found themselves in a uh, really insecure situation. During the years of a singing revolution, both in public life and in the writings of authors and intellectuals, a rhetoric revealing the structure of myth and ritual was prevalent. At that time, several Western observers of the Baltic region were struck by the ritualistic and theatrical nature of Lithuanian public life, perceiving this as something culturally foreign, even dangerously irrational. Uh, one of the first historians of the singing revolution, the British scholar Anatole Levin, recounted the biting irony of a cultural shock he experienced during the third Saibis convention in 1991. Saibis was uh, the reform movement in Lithuania that led the struggle for independence. Uh, uh, the, at that convention, as Levin described it, the rhetorical poetic declamation that opened the political event, the way the entire world stood for prayer, the singing of patriotic hymns between speeches, uh, the collective applause, uh, all of this seemed like a total oddity uh, of political life in the eyes of the British historian. I quote Anatole Levin. Truthfully, not just the inter introduction, but the entirety of the introductory part of the convention reminded me of the national religious theater. All of this not only reminded me of the recent rituals of the Communi Communist Party conventions, but also the rhythms of the Catholic Mass, which strongly influences the Fuenian culture. The criticism of uh, such kind of uh, ritualistic culture also came from the Angry intellectuals. Uh, a famous professor of semiotics, I would assume, Gremus, who lived in Paris, also perceived this uh, faith in the power of symbols uh, uh, and ritual as a major issue, one that, has, that, that was born of a post Soviet mentality. I quote uh, Gremus' uh, irony. We need life-changing reforms, but our lawmakers announced that the academic year starts on the 1st of September in all of Lithuania. Now, we all, uh, now all we need is a law that sets a fixed date for the start of the Christmas holiday, or a law that states that laws are made of wood. The French, on the other hand, would call for extensive national debates to acquaint the nation with, with what awaits them. Uh, Another angry intellectual, Vito Tascavolis, a professor of sociology from the United States, uh, also criticized uh, this sort of ritualized collective liberation as permitted with a denial to grant priority to the rights of the individual, which means it can become just a mask that obscures the unchanged structures of Soviet thinking. One of the specific traits of cultural discourse of that time was the unusual sterility of the social consciousness of writers and intellectuals. In 1990, when the wild capitalistic market started to operate in Lithuania, and with Western pop culture pouring in through all of the media channels, the role, the role of a writer and intellectual was still perceived as central and stable. His thinking was deemed authoritative, spiritually inspiring for the society, and the rising anxiety about the changing social status of, of artists was audacious, audaciously dismissed. I quote a, 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 an intellectual critic, uh, Valentina Svetitskis, uh, his statement in the 1990s. Several creators of spiritual goods continuously grumble about threats to the material welfare of writers. I state this, the most dependable guarantee is the authority of the writer's community during the period of national liberation. Who could imagine that the, that the Lithuania of today would allow its writers to become beggars? Really, who could imagine that? The as yet secure condition of writers in this strange social niche, safeguarded by certain guarantees of cultural importance, and the vague understanding of post-Soviet capitalist change, a severe handicap Western critics, Western critics warned of, uh, can be also illustrated by the following 1990s prediction by the poet Valdas Kukulis, I quote. 
uh, it's a prediction about the future of literature. Literature, including poetry, will clearly become differentiated. There will be kitsch, mass scribbling, and academic university poets. Lack of serious music, the writing of poems, will become a pastime of a spiritual aristocracy. However, this will not occur quickly. No one can convince me that a change in the political order will make Sovietized Lithuanians take work seriously that a functioning leisure and entertainment industry will be rapidly created, and that we will easily change the whole Soviet psychology. This means that we will still have plenty of time for youthful sentiments, past sympathies, past sympathies, and even poetry. Well, it is apparent from the above citations that the changes in post-Soviet reality over the, over the period of few years were very unexpected and sudden. <clears throat> the introduction of free market economics that the dissolution of social security, tangled domestic political intrigue, the fragmentation of society, and the consumerism boom. Unavoidably and quite quickly, it became clear that literary discourse, the, the previous literary discourse, and uh, previous uh, positions of writers had very little to do with the new rea reality, that uh, the, the, these attitudes can no longer set, serve for individuals to get explanations in the post Soviet situation. But an alternative attitude uh, can be illustrated by the ideas of Richard S. Galeris, one of the most famous Lithuanian postmodern authors, whose uh, major novel, the, the poker of Vilnius, uh, was uh, a year ago translated into English. Well, Galeris raised these um, issues in his essays, stating his allergy, allergy to collectivism. During the period of national rebirth, Gavalis demanded that literature free itself from the dualist sense with public mythologies, purge itself of, of its still inadequate understanding of a new environment, and become a totally professional undertaking that actualizes only the free life of the separate individual. In not cho choosing the complete sovereignty of the person, the priority of the free person, literature risks moving towards a new involuntary servitude to collectivism and ending up in another purely Lithuanian, completely national handle. I, I will go to that is now. Even until very recently, Lithuanian writers performed a multitude of functions not characteristic of a true writer. In the eyes of the society, a writer had many professions. Books by writers, both poetry and prose, were often purchased, purchased not for their artistic value, but in the hope of finding in them some pointed social or political statements. An abundance of very pleasant chatter about absolute trifles has emerged, suppressing essential things. And this is very dangerous. Our language influences the world on its own. If language becomes deceptive, it begins to corrupt and destroy the world. Therefore, it is an essential step for a writer in the post-Soviet period to expose the reality and the fictitiousness of its created mythologies of this national theater, and to retreat from social and political processes to develop a skeptical, de deconstructive individual distance. This individual distance and conceptual free thinking linked to the experience of a person's metaphysical freedom is evaluated by Gavaris as a truly Western stance. But if Gavaris were still alive now, he died in 2002, and witnessed young Lithuanian writers uh, appearing on popular TV shows and employing PR company, companies in order to construct their images in the mass media, he probably would have viewed this as a total, total sellout. This involvement in literary image making games in the media and public relations arena and the aspiration to use this as effectively as, posi as possible in seeking out new ways to connect with an audience clearly separates the attitudes of the young generation, the uh, present generation of uh, uh, young writers, from the negative, alienated, alienated position of older postmodernists. Perhaps we can identify this perspective as the search for a new symbiosis with the postmodern social environment in the field. A novelist and playwright, Marius Ivashkiewicz, completely repudiates the purely intellectual position, which is so radically skeptical about consumer space. I quote him Art should not be abstracted 
from the contents of the minds of its consumers. Thus, in place of intellectual sovereignty and provocative criticism, Iwaskiewicz proposes a versatile penetration into the mentality of a post-Soviet consumer society, compared with the existence of literature with a clever social virus. I quote you. Thus, the contemporary writer creates art in the head of the contemporary reader. The consciousness of consumer becomes just as important as that of the creator. I know that you know that I know, says the writer to his reader. I know your stereotypes because they are mine too. Having achieved this, the author can further penetrate the reader's consciousness like a co computer virus, destroying his stereotypes, worldview, and understanding of beauty. The reader's passwords allow him entry. This is how the literary virus beats the viruses that had previously penetrated that consciousness. Because, besides aesthetic purposes, art has another purpose, to recreate values, refresh them, and to confer a new form to a truth that had long ago been worn out. And out end of quote. Undoubtedly, an obvious problem arises. How much is this literary virus able to affect the contemporary consumer mentality? Uh, how much is it able uh, uh, well, uh, to change this uh, artistic experience? And how much it, uh, does it try to, uh, to create a compromise of the uh, consumer, surrender to market and medium and manipulations, and becomes only one more uh, source feeding consumer consciousness without having an impact on its immunity, more a market medicine than a poison or a virus. Uh, well, it is natural that a portion of the popular writers of the younger generation understand this new game with the market and the media as an ethical compromise that recalls the dual exotic language of the Soviet period, uh, that recalls the paradoxes of self-censorship and a partial conformism and partial resistance. Another prose writer of a younger generation, Laura Cynthia Chernovskaya, asserts, I quote, I know the lower boundary which I can never cross. I could not write a book just so that it would sell. This is a boundary I cannot stoop to. But if I write from my very self, and then I have to find a way to get by with income from that book, and if I am offered incentives, then this is acceptable. Although if the process is reversed, is reversed if I start writing so that people buy, this is immoral. So, the problem identified by uh, Richard Gavalis is only repeated. The symbiosis of literature and the post-Soviet, post-modern society raises the question of the boundary between authentic and secret, manipulative, creative work. We can identify all of these varied modes of interaction with the contemporary social reality as only a part of the diverse points of view, experiences, and expressions that appeared in Lithuanian literature after the political and cultural uh, change in the uh, 1990s. And this diversity of attitudes uh, towards uh, the contemporary society also uh, demonstrates that uh, uh, cultural policies uh, in a, uh, a liberal state, in a liberal society, cannot be uh, monolithic, cannot be directed towards uh, clear tasks of a state policy. Uh, I will finish this presentation uh, by drawing your attention to a recently published book, uh, Transitions of Lithuanian Postmodernism, Lithuanian Literature in the Post-Soviet Period. Uh, this book was prepared at our Institute of Lithuanian Literature and published by uh, Rodopi Publishers in Amsterdam and New York. And uh, in fact, this, uh, this is a most comprehensive uh, uh, guide to the English-speaking reader to, uh, reader to the present situation of Lithuanian uh, uh, literature uh, that was published uh, in, in, in a couple of uh, decades. And uh, also uh, the aim is to uh, discuss the specific issues, uh, how the Baltic mentality and identity, Lithuanian identity, and the uh, 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 processes of postmodern globalization intersect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. Um, and our third speaker is Dr. Roman Zlatnik, Ambassador at Large, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Riga, who has changed his topic. Well,
not only ethnically Latvians, but uh, more and more non ethnically Latvians leaving. And uh, with a different character, I would say, than uh, previously. They went actually uh, to the West, they went to the European Union. The frontiers of uh, the United Kingdom uh, were open, and especially after 2004, when we adhered to the European Union, um, people left there. There was a free movement, and they chose. What, without going into into detail, why did they leave? Obviously, according to what you said, the Günter Grass said they they left Latvia because they don't love fun. Obviously, it's the main, the, the, main, the main reason. But there may be other ones. Um, I would stress not only the crisis, etc., but two of them. <coughs> Opportunities. There are probably a couple of people uh, amongst you are people who have been, have been searching for opportunities in the West. Well, as a matter of fact, the opportunities are different, of course. If we have a high diploma, it's not a majority of those who have left. It's about 30% maybe who have a higher diploma. But there are a lot of young students having their diploma afterwards when they are in England or in the United States, Germany, France, etc. But you see that in Ireland, for example, there are only 15% of persons having a higher diploma. And that shows that there are actually lower layers of the Latvian society left, especially to Ireland. You see, you see that very concretely. And some of them, of course, are here in, in, um, in, uh, uh, in London, in the, in the United Kingdom. But the opportunities, what, what does it mean? If we go back, I said the Latvian nation was created exactly when it was possible. President Wilson had uh, his uh, thesis or his points, 14 points of 1917s about self-determination. Those persons who are leaving now, they are reacted very naturally. Vita Motis wrote very, uh, I think, pertinently that in the 80s, uh, change, a twist has uh, happened also in the United States. If you were young in the 60s, 70s, maybe 80s, in the United States, you, uh, it was actually uh, relevant to go into the public service. And she was mentioning Hillary Clinton, for example. But in the mid 80s, uh, more and more, you had actually an, a, a growing tendency of being very much egoistic, and going into actually some kind of hedonistic approach of life and enjoying life. I'm talking about the West here. Unfortunately, that's uh, when uh, the Latvian independence came. And, and the Latvians so, uh, were leaving a state of a totalitarian regime which after the 30s, during the Uman, Uman, Umanist regime, it was actually a collective approach of the state. During, of course, the Soviet regime, we still had a collective approach of the state. And so what do you have? You have people going out of, of a collectivist mentality directly into the new, in a, into a modern world, where the individual has a very uh, important uh, aim. And when you see even uh, the European uh, uh, institutions, they are dealing with the individual. So there is actually no uh, a surprise that these young people, especially leaving Latvia, want to have action, to, to, to prove themselves, and that they have less interest uh, in, in something that has to deal with the state, especially that the state which they were growing up before 1990 was a repressive state and it doesn't have a very good reputation and a lot of people are avoiding anything that has to do with the state. So we come to the other, uh, the first reason was opportunity, the second reason would be then, uh, um, let's say, social security. It is what is given uh, the approach of the social state, uh, whether it is in Germany, in France, is to help the individual, but also at the, an economical level. And we have then a lot of the people who have left Latvia, most of them, they are not many self-employed people. Most, in the, the largest majority are people being employed or 
unemployed, of course. Well, they come here, whatever they do, they actually enjoy the security, the stability, whether they are working or not, for some of them is even a secondary question. But then if we go, and that's what I, I, I get into the culture, what has struck me is that if you have these people searching for opportunities, they have no difficulty at all to, uh, to engage, to get integrated in the local society, whether, wherever it is. They are articulate, they are educated. And then you have the other part, the ones leaving because they want to leave somehow, and then you read that there is an excellent uh, uh, theater play by a Latvian uh, uh, um, actor who is actually describing the life here in London. And it's, uh, it, there you have Lithuanians, we have Latvians, Poles, etc., living together in uh, conditions that are incredible. I have seen similar things in Spain. And then I've seen also that you see in Spain uh, the, the, the driver of the Lithuanian ambassador is a Lithuanian, he married a Russian girl, etc. You have actually under or subcultures uh, 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 created, and here I'm not talking about only then uh, uh, the, the, the lowest layer, I can tell you that it is not easy to be a foreigner, even in Spain where people are so friendly, and all foreigners that I know, even the British ones, they're actually getting with each other together. They are not uh, mingling with the rest of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the society. Well, then what, what do we see? We have somehow people who have made a choice, and I'm talking about a choice of society, they choose not anymore to leave to Russia, they choose to leave to the European Union, or where the, the countries where the European, princi uh, European principles are in vigor. That's their choice. Then in their culture, for some of them, there is something of the Eastern part of their mentality. That's where there is fun, maybe, Man, that they, they go back to that. And so there are more or less not, some of them not integrated. And, and, and I think, I think uh, uh, it, it is very much at the detriment of a lot of things. It is very fashionable in Latvia to say at the moment we are not the European Union, or they in Europe. We are not belonging somehow to Europe. Where did we lose that aspect? Well, obviously during the Soviet time. Beforehand, where we uh, declared independence, Latvia was naturally a European nation. And actually, if you look at history, well, it goes back to uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the beginning of the Christianity in the uh, uh, 12th and 13th century. And what fascinates me is that in uh, 1242, uh, you know the famous uh, uh, movie of, um, by um, Eisenstein, Alexander Nevsky. This is actually an historical thing. He was from Riga, so he knew what was the German boss. That's one aspect. So he could make this film. Another uh, a Russian would not have made this film. But what is interesting is that the, the, the boundary of the European Union was put in 12,042. That's where it was done. You had a boundary between Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity. Then you can jump centuries. You see European, East, European history in Latvia in I'm, another date which fascinates me, 1524, the first Lutheran parish in Riga. The thesis of Luther was were in 1517. There was no facts, nothing. The first Lutheran parish outside Germany was in Riga. The same year as at the other side of the German culture sphere, cultural sphere in Strasbourg, first Lutheran parish. There was Andreas Knock who went and see Melan or so Melanchthon and came back and, and there was a parish in, in, in Latvia. And at 20, uh, 1524, actually, is the date when you see in San Sebastian that they arrested a, a boat in Spain and they took the Lutheran literature and they burnt it. That's the southern reaction to that. We were part of the European history. I would jump, I don't know, to the 19th century, 
the, the national awakening came exactly at the same time as in the rest of Europe. In the Baltic provinces, Estonia and the uh, biggest part of Latvia in the, in the 1810s, where the abolition of, uh, uh, took place, the abolition of serfdom, in, industrious people were starting to work, there was crediting, etc. We became economically active and educated. That means that we were ready for national awakening, then we were ready for social democracy later on, etc. We were on the map of Europe. And suddenly you have people since 20 years, for in the last 20 years, I see a lot of Latvians not knowing their history. This is what actually, how, uh, how I hate actually the communist regime, which was in Latvia more than 20 years before, because I see the damage that has been done, not to everybody in Hungary, but to a lot of people, a kind of a brainwashing. What happens? All the ties were with the family, with the western part of Europe, were broken. Imagine that, that the, all, the, um, all beaches were cleaned every day in order to see if somebody was fleeing to the west. And there was the reinvention of, the, of a culture. It was a monolingual culture. And I'm finishing it, if you wish, of course. <laughs> what I want to say uh, is that uh, um, the totalitarian regime was a, 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 a freezing time, freezing of everything. And, uh, and now we are suddenly for the 20 years in a movement, in time of movement, free movement, and it's very difficult to recover. 50 years of freezing time in 20 years, and people are just reacting almost, I would say, uh, uh, with the gas leaving Latvia. And that's what I have to, to deal about in my job. I don't know if I have uh, been clear. I hope that you understand to my point. Thank you, Thank you. Ivan. Locate cultural processes in that larger historical perspective, but also in the sort of socio-economic perspective, demographic perspective. And I think what's really um, important about about this panel is, is that it, it doesn't take a, an impossible leap of of the mind to see connections between the processes that have been described you know, going on in the cultural sphere. Um, this afternoon to some of the processes which are described in terms of defense and politics and, and uh, uh, knowledge-based economies uh, earlier. And, and that's very important, if I can speak for 30 seconds, that's very important to us at UCL and, and at CIS because it's enormously important and very challenging, in fact, in the contemporary uh, world where we're asked to uh, explain how study of culture is in some kind of way relevant or useful, or in, to use the word that has uh, currency in the UK at the moment, impactful, it's very important to, to find the ways which are not strained ways, but which are actually authentic and intellectually justifiable ways to talk about culture in wider contexts that um, resonate beyond the, the narrow uh, bounds academic scholarship on, on literature and culture. And I think the, the, the three uh, speakers this afternoon have in their different ways contributed very valuably to, to that kind of broader understanding of why cultural processes are not irrelevant to uh, uh, the kind of um, questions that um, the sort of policy makers and, and sort of think, think of the ones that we should be focusing upon. So it's, you know, it's not just research for research sake. It's, uh, Professor Barshowskis mentioned this, this morning research also has to be for, to answer real questions. I don't actually agree with him. I think research for research sake is valuable in itself, but I think the trick is to, to find where research for research sake is, is, is that, but, but not only that. And I think our speakers this afternoon have shown us ways to do that, so you'll excuse me sort of speaking from the heart as the director of an institution which is constantly sort of has this question posed to it and, and, and I had got enormous enjoyment from our panel.